Okay, so we're gonna get started. Um, thank you everyone for coming to my CE. So loosen up a little. Um, today we're going to talk about cystic fibrosis. So as for disclosures, I have no financial interests, arrangements, or affiliations with any organization. And for today, the brand names that will be used will be for educational purposes only. And then I just wanted to acknowledge Amanda Waldeck for looking over this presentation. And so today we have four objectives that we're going to cover. Uh, first, starting with defining and understanding the pathophysiology of cystic fibrosis, identifying how it's diagnosed and interpreted um, using the tests for screening. We're gonna be able to recognize new therapy and medication developments in management. And then also we're going to be able to recall the current guidance for management, um, understanding the mechanisms of those CFTR modulators. So first starting off, woe to the child who tastes salty from a kiss on the brow for he is cursed and soon will die. So this is a European proverb from the 15th century cautioning parents um, because salty skin typically led to an unavoidable death preceded by rasping agony or a witch's curse. And most children did not make it past the age of five. Uh, but today we know that this folklore spoke of the genetic disease cystic fibrosis and drastic advances, advances have been made since then. So what is cystic fibrosis? Cystic fibrosis is a multi-system disorder that results from mutations in the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator or the CFTR, which is how I'm going to refer to it in this presentation. It's a gene and it has instructions for making the CFTR protein. This protein is made of 1,480 amino acids. And then on the right-hand side in the image, um, this is demonstrating normal CFTR production with DNA in the nucleus providing the instructions, RNA acting as the template for transcription, ribosomes perform translation, and the CFTR protein moves across the cell. And once it reaches the surface, it begins its function of being a chloride channel. And this helps to maintain the right balance of fluid in the airways. And around a decade ago, patients with um, cystic fibrosis had a life, in, life expectancy of 38, but currently um, the life expectancy is 53 years old. So cystic fibrosis is a autosomal recessive disease. And what that means is that everyone has two copies of the CFTR gene, one copy inherited from their mother and one from their father. And a person must have mutations in both copies of the CFTR gene to have cystic fibrosis. Interestingly, in the United States, about one in 31 people are carriers for the gene. Most people don't even know it and they don't have symptoms, but some actually um, say that they do have mild symptoms. So now moving on to the pathophysiology. So essentially cystic fibrosis occurs um, because of that CFTR gene defect, which is a defective chloride channel. And that means that the protein either doesn't work well, isn't produced sufficiently, or isn't produced at all. And that results in abnormal chloride conductance and ineffective transport of bicarb and glutathione. So in the image that you're looking at in the center of the screen with the red circle, we have a normal lung um, with your CFTR functioning at the epithelial airway cell. We have regular chloride conduction. There's a lot of hydration. The cilia are able to move that green bacterium and mucus away um, so the airway is free. Whereas on the right-hand side in a cystic fibrosis um, cell or airway cell, the chloride ions are trapped inside the cell. There's no airway surface liquid attracted to the outside of the cell, and therefore the mucus in the airway is dehydrated and thick. The cilia is unable to sweep away the thick, sticky, neutrophil-dominated mucus. It's difficult to breathe, and germs can easily get caught. And we have that redness, which is indicating inflammation, mucus plugging, and airway obstruction. So this is the pathophysiology of a CFTR in the sweat gland. And when there's a CFTR malfunction, there's failure of the chloride channel to reabsorb chloride. And this leads to a loss of sodium onto the skin surface and a subsequent fluid loss. So this causes that pathogenomic salty skin. 
Then we have defective CFTR function that can occur in the liver, and that would result in bile duct obstruction, which can result in cirrhosis or portal hypertension. And then additionally, there can be mucus that blocks the pancreatic duct. And then lastly, cystic fibrosis affects reproductive health by presenting calculable genetic risk to offspring, which we saw before with the pedigree as well as delayed sexual maturation and reduced fertility. And approximately 97% to 98% of men with cystic fibrosis are infertile because of the abnormal development of the vas deferens and the seminal vesicles. So something that's not, that not most people know about cystic fibrosis is that it can be categorized into mutations one through six. And these mutations are based on how the defect changes the functionality of the gene. So the severity of the class is based on the mutation class and more severe is classes one through three, because as you can see, there's no protein being formed or it's being degraded or it's fully defective, resulting in having the least chloride transport. And so to date, there's been more than 2000 different CFTR mutations that have been reported. Now moving on to diagnosis. So for initial screening, it's different in every state, but for New York State, they perform something called newborn screening, which is a genetic medical test for early recognition and treatment of disorders, and it screens for 50 different disorders, with one of those being cystic fibrosis. And this is done during the first few days of a baby's life, and then a few weeks later, and it's using only a few drops of blood from a heel prick onto a Guthrie card. And for cystic fibrosis, the blood is tested to check for something called immunoreactive trypsinogen, which is a chemical made in the pancreas. And it's normally found in small levels in the body, but in patients that have cystic fibrosis, it tends to be higher. So a positive newborn screening result does not mean a baby has cystic fibrosis, only that it's possible that they have cystic fibrosis and they would require further testing. So this is sort of the algorithm to follow when diagnosing a patient with cystic fibrosis. So first we're starting with detecting that IRT. Based on that level, we would move on to a screening sweat test. And then if that were positive, we're more likely to believe that the diagnosis is cystic fibrosis. And then we would move on to CFTR sequencing and genetically confirming the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. So a sweat test is relatively simple. The way it works is that an electrode is taped over the area of the skin, whether that's the forearm or the leg and a weak electrical current will be sent through the electrode to make the pilocarpine, which is our cholinergic, to seep into the skin. The sweat is collected by taping a piece of filter paper, paper or gauze on the area by using a small plastic foil, and then that sweat sample is sent to the lab for testing. And what they're looking for is a chloride level of 60 millimoles per liter or greater, and that would make us lean more towards this patient has cystic fibrosis. So now we have a patient case. We're looking at baby Jane, and baby Jane was just born this morning. When should we perform newborn screening? You can write it in the chat or you could um, unmute yourself. Yeah, correct. So that would be A, which is now. So newborn screening should be performed in the first 24 hours of life. Now moving on to signs and symptoms. Um, so the way that a patient would present um, with cystic fibrosis could have a variety of these manifestations. Um, and that would include a cough that doesn't go away, often with thick mucus or blood. There could be wheezing or shortness of breath and a decreased FEV1. And a FEV is essentially forced expiratory volume, and it measures how much air a person can exhale during a forced breath. So a person with cystic fibrosis who is weighed down by lots of mucus and unable to clear it, their FEV is gonna be a lot more decreased. They can have hypoxia, which can lead to clubbing of the fingers. In children, it can lead to poor growth or poor weight gain. They can also have greasy or bad smelling stools just due to the poor absorption of nutrients and fat-soluble vitamins. 
So one of the most common comorbidities in cystic uh, fibrosis patients is cystic fibrosis related diabetes, which further complicates cystic fibrosis and leads to poor nutritional status, worsened lung function and increased mortality. So this is known as quote unquote type three diabetes because essentially what's happening is there's a gene mutation which blocks up the pancreatic ducts. We have fibrosis and fatty infiltration leading to beta cell destruction and essentially insulin deficiency. So currently insulin is the standard medical treatment since these patients are essentially insulin deficient. And many reports indicate that insulin therapy stabilizes lung function, improves the nutritional status of these patients, improves their A1C control, and reduces their rates of pulmonary exacerbation and decreases mortality. So this graph is from 2021, and it's a patient annual data registry that shows the proportion of individuals in various age groups with cystic fibrosis who cultured positive for certain bacterial species indicated during 2021. So I just wanted to draw your attention to first the green line um, at the very top. As you can see, it's um, spiking upwards, and that's early in life, and that's um, indicating Staphylococcus aureus is more prevalent in early life. And then the other line I wanted to draw your attention to was the light blue line, which is lower early in life and then tends to slope upwards. And this is indicating that Pseudomonas aeruginosa is more prevalent later on in life. So as you can see for long-term complications, cystic fibrosis does not only affect the lungs, it can affect so many other organs um, and it can manifest as turning into COPD, causing pulmonary hypertension, it can cause increased work of breathing, hemoptysis, drug resistance, lots of things. So back to the patient case, Jane. From her screening, we find out that Jane has cystic fibrosis. She's now three years old. She doesn't feel well. Her constant cough, fever, and wheezing indicate pneumonia, and her culture results come back today. What is most, the most likely organism causing her lung infection? Yes, C, perfect. So Staphylococcus aureus early on in life, Pseudomonas later in life. So now moving on to supportive care. So all patients are going to use this very specifically uh, sequenced regimen for their chronic maintenance of cystic fibrosis. It's not just used for exacerbations. And it has a goal of effective airway clearance, preventing and treating lung infections, maintaining adequate nutrition, slowing disease progression, and optimizing quality of life. So the way it works is first, you're going to want to perform airway clearance therapy, which consists of a bronchodilator to open the airway. Secondly, a hypertonic saline to mobilize the mucus, the Dornase alpha to thin the mucus, and then chest PT or physical therapy to improve airway clearance. And then lastly would be the antibiotics that would be able to get in in order to control airway infection. So for our bronchodilators, we have two choices. So we have our albuterol and our levalbuterol, which come in MDI and nebulization dosing. As for the Zopinex, it actually has not been investigated in clinical trials specifically in patients with cystic fibrosis. However, the safety and effectiveness of the treatment has been evaluated in a number of trials in other obstructive airway conditions, such as asthma in both adults and children. Then moving on to mucolytics with the goal of mobilizing and thinning the mucus. So we have our hypertonic saline, our Dornase alpha, or mannitol. So for the hypertonic saline, that hydrates the airway mucus secretion for the mucociliary function. And there was a Cochrane re review from 2005 that showed that overall lung function improved with the use of hypertonic saline compared with placebo, but that the improvement was not as great as that seen with Dornase alpha. So that makes a lot of sense that within the sequence, it's hypertonic saline followed by Dornase alpha. And then in the Journal of Cystic Fibrosis, they discuss an international randomized controlled study, which concluded that in adults with cystic fibrosis, um, mannitol inhaled as a dry powder actually statistically significantly improved lung function compared with control. 
Now moving on to airway clearance techniques. So first we have chest percussion and vibration, and that's essentially a cupped hand pounding on the chest wall in order to loosen and drain the mucus. And then we have a percussion vest, which uses high frequency chest wall oscillation. For aerobic exercises, these are strength-based activities and they're important for bone health and muscle, muscle strength. And then lastly, we have autogenic drainage, which is essentially is a breathing technique using different speeds of breathing to move the mucus. So it's a learned technique of unsticking, collecting, and evacuating the mucus. So next we have our antibiotics, which consist of aerosolized tobramycin and aerosolized as trianam. And these two target uh, pseudomonas colonization to decrease infection, hospitalizations, improve pulmonary function, and prevent pulmonary failure. And inhaled antibiotics allow high concentration at an infection site without the systemic toxicities. And we dose these 28 days on and 28 days off, and that's to limit the development of resistance. Currently, it actually still remains unclear which inhaled antibiotic treatment option should be labeled as the gold standard for the eradication of pseudomonas. And then as you can see, there's a pretty bold line separating oral azithromycin. So I just wanted to make a point to say that Azithromycin is not being used as an alternative to one of these anti-pseudomonals. It can be used in conjunction with and has the sole purpose of aiding in the in decreasing inflammation. So to support that statement, um, we have something called the OPTIMIZE trial, um, which stands for Optimizing Treatment for Early Pseudomonas Aeruginosa Infection in Cystic Fibrosis. And this trial was a multi-center, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial which was over 18 months. And it was essentially giving um, patients azithromycin or placebo three times weekly with their standardized tobramycin inhalation solution. And the objective was to test the hypothesis that by adding azithromycin to a tobramycin regimen, it'll decrease the risk of pulmonary exacerbation and prolong the time to a pseudomonas reoccurrence. What they found was that the risk of pulmonary exacerbation was actually reduced by 44% in the azithromycin group as compared with the placebo group. And they concluded that azithromycin was associated with significant reduction in the risk of these exacerbations, but no impact on the microbiological outcomes in children with early pseudomonas. And so this trial really supports the use of azithromycin as a complementary approach to aid in, the, in decreasing the inflammation and reducing that risk of exacerbation. So as for pancreatic enzyme products, patients with cystic fibrosis have obstructions from thick secretions in the pancreas, which reduces the release of pancreatic enzymes. Between 85 and 90% of individuals with cystic fibrosis have pancreatic insufficiency. And the way that dosing works is you have a starting recommended dose, and then you make adjustments based on patient response and diminishing symptoms. So for example, a patient that's on too low of a dose may present with abdominal pain, gas, bloating, or distension. And someone that's on too high of a dose could have constipation and some of those toxicities listed on the slide, such as irritations, um, with pain, or itching. So really, when it comes to trying to figure out the dose is really based on the patient's symptoms and how they're presenting and then adjusting from there. So this slide was really just for reference of the different types of PEPs or pancreatic enzyme products and just an overall blanket statement that brands are not interchangeable. So bringing it back to the patient case with Jane, Jane had a growth spurt. She requires adjustment for her Creon dose. And after two weeks, her belly looks rather distended and she complains of abdominal pain. So how can we help Jane? Yep, so B. So her dose is too low. So that's resulting in bloating. She would, she would need a dose increase um, for a high dose she would have, um, she would potentially experience irritation or inflammation as mentioned with the toxicities. 
So this was a comparison of Zenpep and Creon for exocrine insufficiency in patients with cystic fibrosis. And it was a randomized, double-blind, active-controlled, crossover, multinational, non-inferiority study comparing Zenpep and Creon, which are two porcine-derived pancreatic enzyme products. It was conducted at 34 sites. And so the primary objective of this study was to evaluate the safety and efficacy of Zenpep compared with Creon in patients with this exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And what they were looking at was a coefficient of fat absorption over 72 hours, which is calculated from dietary fat intake and stools collected during the last three days of treatment period. And overall, what they found was that Zenpep demonstrated both non-inferiority and equivalence to Creon in dietary fat absorption. But although comparable, no single product seems to work best for everyone. A switch from one product to another can dramatically improve um, digestion and reduce GI distress for one patient, while switch in the opposite direction may do the same for another. So ultimately, it's a not a one-size-fits-all. So now moving on to CFTR modulators. So this graph is really just to demonstrate that people are living longer due to the new advances in medicine. So using these CFTR modulators. So on the very bottom, I have a couple of arrows and those are pointing to the FDA approval dates of some of the modulators we're about to talk about. So in 2012, we had Ivacaptor. In 2015, we have Orcambi. 2018 is Syndeco and 2019 is Trikafta. But before we get into our modulators, I just wanted to revisit this chart because many of the modulators will be functional depending on the type of mutation. So on the screen, as you can see, the most common mutation is a prototypical class two mutation called the F508. And it accounts for 70% of all mutations um, and it's essentially when the phenylalanine amino acid is deleted, and that's what causes the mutation of being targeted for degradation. So first, we're going to talk about our potentiator. And this mechanism is that it maximizes the duration of activity of existing CFTR channels on the epithelial cell surface to increase chloride transport. So in simple terms, it's essentially just holding the chloride gate open for longer and it addresses type three and type four mutations. It's administered before or after high fat containing foods because the fat helps the body absorb the medicine better. And some of the precautions are CNS effects as well as hepatic effects with the increased hepatic transaminases. So for Ivacaptor, the indication is a treatment of cystic fibrosis in patients aged four months and older and who have one of the following mutations in the CFTR gene, which are listed for your reference. Um, this medication has every 12 hour dosing. And it also has a relatively innocuous side effect profile, nothing too drastic, um, headache, upper respiratory tract infection. So on here, um, these first three trial successes are the reason for the current indications of Ivacaptor for specific mutations previously listed in the package insert, but I wanted to draw your attention to the bottom one, which is an important thing to note, um, that Ivacaptor is not effective in patients with cystic fibrosis who are homozygous for the F508 mutation in the CFTR gene. And this makes a lot of sense because as mentioned before, the F508 is a class two mutation, which is a processing defect, and Ivacaptor addresses class three and four mutations, which is gating and conductance. So as for correctors, we have Lumacaptor, Tisacaptor, and Alexacaptor, and these are solely used in combination with a potentiator, so used with Ivacaptor. And that's because when they're used alone, correctors don't relieve cystic fibrosis symptoms. And the way correctors work is they essentially facilitate the movement of the CFTR to the surface of epithelial cells in order to enable its function of regulating a fluoride channel. And then as for precautions, it can cause cataracts or hepatic effects. And then the main thing that I wanted to mention was the interactions with CYP3A4 inducers and inhibitors. Um, this is obviously very important because it's something that we track. Um, so for um, a doctor that orders fluconazole, which is our inhibitor, um, using 
uh, combination with Trikafta, it would require a dose adjustment with every other day dosing. Whereas if a inducer was put on the profile, such as phenobarbital, it can greatly decrease Ivacaftor concentration. And so it's fully recommended to avoid and find an alternative. So this was really just a visual to help understand how the corrector and the potentiator work together. So at the bottom in the orange, we have Lumicaftor, and its sole purpose is to bring the CFTR protein to the cell surface, where Ivacaftor can then work and help the protein stay open for longer so that we can have the chloride conductance. So now moving on to Orcambi, which is Lumicaftor with Ivacaftor. And this is prescribed for patients uh, one year and older who have two copies of the F508 mutation, which is the most common cystic fibrosis mutation. And this is the only modulator available to very young children with these mutations. I also just wanted to mention um, one of the side effects of or can be is chest discomfort and productive cough. So as for the trials for Orcambi, there were two trials, and in both trials, treatment with Orcambi resulted in statistically significant improvement in that FEV, as mentioned before, regardless of the patient's age, disease, severity, and sex. Too far. Okay, now moving on to Simdeco. Syndeco is for the treatment of patients with cystic fibrosis aged six years and older who are homozygous for the F508 deletion mutation, who have at least one copy of 154 mutations in the CFTR gene that is responsive to Syndeco. So the main difference between Lumicaptor and Tezacaptor is that Tezacaptor has been shown to have fewer side effects, such as that chest tightness, as well as less drug interactions than Lumicaptor. So once again, I just want to draw your attention to the study at the bottom, the third study. So this study was terminated early for futility because Syndeco did not improve lung function. A single F508 allele is not sufficient to provide clinical benefit with Syndeco treatment. But to address this little snag, we have Trikafta. And Trikafta is made up of two correctors that work synergistically. They work at alternate binding sites as well as in combination with the potentiator. So because Alexacaftor corrects an additional flaw in the formation of the F508 protein, it's included with Syndeco. Um, and that helps the CFTR protein perform better than other modulators for an even greater number of people with cystic fibrosis. So Trikafta is indicated for the treatment of cystic fibrosis for patients six years and older who have at least one F508 mutation in the CFTR gene or at least one copy of 177 specified mutations. And this one also has quite um, a, an innocuous side effect profile of headache or nasal congestion. In the two trials um, for Trikafta, it was Trikafta versus placebo as well as Trikafta versus Syndeco, which is without the Alexacaftor. So Trikafta actually had statistical significance in both trials in FEV improvement. So bringing it back to the patient case with Jane, Jane is being put on a fancy new CFTR modulator. She is seven years old and she has asthma. According to her gene sequencing, she is homozygous for the F508 mutation. Which modulator do you think she should get? Anybody can guess, even if it's wrong. So the answer is Simdeco. So um, although or can be, can be used in homozygous F508, Jane has asthma and or can be can cause chest tightness, as well as Ivacaptor does not cover that F. 508, it covers um, mutations three and four. So now moving on to last line treatment. 
So each year, approximately 10% of people with advanced cystic fibrosis die without a transplant, while only 6 to 8% undergo transplant as a life-sustaining treatment option. And on average, people with cystic fibrosis wait 18 months for a transplant, but many will wait even longer. So this is a very complex, high-risk, but potentially life-saving therapy for end-stage lung disease of cystic fibrosis. It's quite the process. Um, it starts with assessment and then being listed and then waiting for an organ and transplant and then recovery. But cystic fibrosis, as we know, is a genetic condition. So even though the transplanted lungs will not have CF and will never develop it, the rest of the person's body will continue to have cystic fibrosis. So about half will survive for at least five years after having a lung transplant, with many people living for at least 10 years. And there have also been a couple of cases of people living for 20 years or more after a lung transplant. So now moving on to future treatment. So in the future, we are looking at gene therapy, and this can be separated based on non-integrating or integrating, and each of them have advantages and disadvantages. So starting with non-integrating gene therapy, this is essentially like placing a new page between the covers of an existing book without permanently attaching it. So even though the gene therapy does not become part of the genome, the cell can still use the new copy of the CFTR gene to make normal CFTR proteins. And then on the other side of things, we have integrating gene therapy. And this kind of gene therapy is like binding a new page into an existing book. And this is very similar to CAR T-cell therapy for patients with leukemia and lymphoma. So moving on to mRNA therapy, so currently one of the most frequently discussed chemical entities in the context of its use is the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. So the way that this works is it delivers a new correct copy of CFTR mRNA to cells, allowing them to produce the healthy CFTR protein. And some of the options currently being explored include delivery via nebulization and via lipid nanoparticle. So to the picture on the right, we have a lipid nanoparticle, which is bringing the RNA to produce the CFTR, since the nucleus at the very bottom is creating these mutant CFTRs, which are not allowing for that chloride conductance. And once again, there's also advantages and disadvantages of using this therapy as well. So there's also a lot of drugs coming down the development pipeline. So we have our four main CFTR modulators at the top, which are approved and being given to patients. But at the bottom, which are starred, these are some of the medications that are under investigation that they're looking at. Um, and so I just wanted to point out a couple that I found really interesting. Um, so where it says VX-121 with Tezacaptor and VX-561. So VX-561 is altered in a way that makes it a more stable version of Ivacaptor. And that would allow for once daily dosing as opposed to that twice daily dosing. The other one I want to point out was 4D710. And this is exploring a new gene delivery vehicle or a viral vector delivering healthy CFTR genes into the lungs. Additionally, there's also advances even occurring on the mucociliary clearance front. And then as for anti-infectives, there's quite a few that are under investigation. So I wanted to point out the intravenous gallium. So gallium is a molecule nearly identical to iron that disrupts iron-dependent biological processes and has been shown to kill antibiotic-resistant strains of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, as well as researchers are looking into inhaled nitric oxide because they believe that increasing the levels of nitric oxide in the body could help eliminate bacteria, and increase lung function in people with cystic fibrosis. And then lastly, we have our nutritional or GI, so for our um, vitamin deficiencies, they're looking at two new ones, which is adrolipase and Synspira. And these are both man-made versions of a lipase enzyme, one's taken from yeast and one's taken from bacteria. So thanks to her meds, Jane is at a ripe old age living with her cystic fibrosis. So in conclusion, cystic fibrosis does not only affect the lungs, it can affect many other organs. 
there's a very specific order of therapy or specific sequence so that we can provide ideal supportive care for cystic fibrosis patients. And as you can see, there's a lot of exploration into gene therapy as well as meds on the drug development pipeline. So there's a lot more up and coming. Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs>